Good afternoon. Welcome to the Science Track 2020-21 edition. This is the uh, What is Engineering panel. Uh, if this surprises any of you, that's okay. You're welcome to stay. If you need to, though, you can head out the back. Uh, a reminder that we need to be fully masked, uh, masks over nose and mouth, uh, unless you are taking a sip of water. Uh, we really appreciate that. That will help us have uh, a healthy con, and we thank all of you for helping make that happen. Uh, before we get started, a mention that we are collecting for charity, the Big Brothers and Big Sisters of Metro Atlanta. It's a really great organization. Uh, Dragon Con is going to match $100,000, up to $100,000. I would like to see Dragon Con have to pay that. So if you would care to contribute to that, that would be really great. Um, I would also like to mention that at 5.30 this afternoon in the Crystal Ballroom, which is down a level and back that way, we are going to have one of our big ballroom panels, which is Kaiju Mapping Godzilla, Kong, and Sharknadoes, in which a legitimate emergency manager is going to talk about how you would deal with an emergency like a Sharknado or a Godzilla. I would like to strongly vouch for that. It's yes. such a good time. It's very good. All right. So with that out of the way, thank you for coming. Let's start the panel. I would like to start by having my panelists introduce themselves. We'll start with you and move down, if you will. Give a little bit of your background and how you ended up in engineering. Okay, <laughs> me off, right? <laughs> okay, well, I guess it's afternoon now, right? So I'm Theta Daniels Race. Uh, you get fancy, you can call it Dr. <laughs> Dr. Race, or as my students shorten it. I am a professor at Louisiana State University in the Division of Electrical and Computer Engineering. Um, the quick background, as they say in academia, that what's your pedigree? I don't usually like that term because it makes you sound like a puppy, but, you know, and I like dogs. But if you must know, no, so um, my uh, undergraduate degree was from Rice. Um, then I did a doctorate, I'm sorry, I did my master's out at Stanford and then my doctorate at Cornell. That was all on fellowships and scholarships, y'all. My family's not wealthy. Um, and I mentioned, I, I always mention for my friends in science as I came to learn, yes, I did a master's on purpose. It's, I did not flunk the qualifying exam for the, for the PhD, <laughs> okay? I went to Stanford with... A, a fellowship that paid specifically for the masters, and, and and also I wanted to see, you know, what was the whole Silicon Valley deal was about. So, after that, I worked. Uh, after I got my doctorate from Cornell, then I moved to uh, we moved to uh, North Carolina, where I was a professor at Duke for over a decade. We never ran into each other, as far as I know. I think we're getting your doctorate there. <laughs> Makes me feel ancient because I was, and then uh, literally I got a phone call out of the blue. Uh, I'm a, an experimentalist in terms of my work. I deal with um, nanoelectronic materials and the opto and electrical, uh, mainly electrical, but some optical phenomena um, that they exhibit. And our group is called, my group is the Applied Hybrid Electronic Materials and Structures Group, or HEMS. We would have said just leave off the S, but it's would have been like, <laughs> like you're clearing your throat. So we deal with hybrid electronic materials, which would be semiconductors, metals, insulators, you know, um, bio, uh, uh, biological species, what have you. And um, the bottom line of all that is I, was at Duke, got a phone call one day out of the blue, and somebody said, um, I hear you're thinking of leaving Duke, because they were going in a theoretical direction on experimental. So I'm like, how did you know this? So I didn't apply for this job, but I went <laughs> and gave a talk, and they went, here's some money, and here's some equipment, and <laughs> would you like to come here? And it wasn't a pay cut. And I was like, cool. And I'm originally actually from New Orleans, so we didn't dare tell my parents until we know for sure, because the grandkids, like, you can't tell a grandparent that you're going to move that close, and then like not like the job. So in any event, but, um, and my folks are okay. They are in New Orleans as we speak. But uh, with that, engineering and how I got to it, uh, later is a little bit too long of a story and I don't want to take time away from my fellow panelists. But there you go. <laughs> Great, thank you. Uh, so my name is Matt Jarrett. I um, <clears throat> have a mechanical engineering bachelor's degree uh, from UMass and I've worked as an engineer uh, in many um, or several different uh, defense and medical device uh, companies. And uh, I've mostly been working in operations engineering, which includes manufacturing engineering, uh, quality engineering, process development, and um, uh, I had a real strong uh, focus on lean methodologies and like lean manufacturing and, and like Toyota Way kind of stuff, um, which uh, just ha kind of happened to be because um, the first company that I got an internship with had a, had a really strong program for it, and it just kind of fell into it and spent hundreds and hundred, hundreds of hours doing that. Uh, I 
I have a really crazy story about how I got into engineering. I had no idea what it was um, <laughs> up until uh, I had uh, a girlfriend that was going to UMass for uh, an open house and said, "Oh, why don't you why don't you come along?" I said, "Sure." And then I saw like a, a, I saw a piece of paper and it said, like, "Engineering, what is it?" And I said, "Oh, well, that's I've always heard that term. Why don't I go find out?" <laughs> um, and and when I went there, I saw mechanical engineering and I said, "Oh, well, that's exactly what I want to do for the rest of my life." Because I was the kid who always took apart the VCR and the the, the vacuum, and my parents freaked out. And I said, "Don't worry, just it, it'll go back together." And uh, and it always did. And um, and so that was just perfect for me. And I had never known what it was. And so I think this is a really cool opportunity for some people to just find out what is it. Nice. Thank you. Hey, I'm Ashley Roper. Um, I have a uh, degree in aerospace engineering from Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University and a master's degree um, from there as well in um, engineering with a focus in aeronautics. Um, I Most of my uh, background is in uh, flight aerodynamics and design work, so I spent a lot of my time, um, well, a lot of the last decade, um, at a company uh, doing aer aerodynamics design for luxury business jets. Um, and now I'm doing um, uh, hypersonic uh, computational fluid dynamics for the DOD. So um, I have a lot of uh, like really kind of raw design work and a lot of like computational um, uh, computational work in my, in my history. Um, and how I got into engineering, let's see. Well, this one's kind of easy and my story is pretty lame, but um, <laughs> I, uh, I wanted to be an astronaut. I wanted to be an astronaut when I was like four and I was like, hey, I want to be an astronaut. And they're like, okay, my, I told my parents and they were like, okay, you need a degree in a, in a scientific field. And I was like, cool, let's do engineering because I love finding out how things work and taking things apart and building things. And I'm like, that's perfect. And then I got into it and I was like, yeah, I kind of just want to do this and send people up there like, I don't think I need to go. So. <laughs> cool. I'm Topher Hunter. Um, I also actually really loved uh, aerospace and thought about being an astronaut when I was a little kid. Um, ended up going to Caltech for um, in, entering as uh, in aerospace engineering. By the way, Big Bang Theory is a complete lie. There's no apartment buildings that tall in all of Pasadena. <laughs> um, I uh, went to Caltech for aerospace engineering uh, during my first semester, realized that I was probably not smart enough to get a good job in aerospace, so I uh, switched over to mechanical because I could, realized I could probably do a lot of the same things, um, but I'd have a slightly wider uh, set of options uh, for me personally, um, not to downplay aerospace, very cool field. Um, but uh, then about uh, my junior year, I was also, I signed up as a first responder, got trained as a first responder on campus. Uh, that got me interested in the medicine. And then I discovered this whole field called biomedical engineering. So uh, then I ended up going to Georgia Tech uh, for a master's and a PhD in biomedical engineering, went up to Canada as a postdoctoral fellow, uh, became a professor there realized I could not stand academia. Sorry, Theta. Uh, I'm just going to try to insult the entire panel, apparently. Um, uh, so left academia, uh, moved to industry, where since 2010, I've worked for various medical device manufacturers. And today, I do principally science education on microbiology. So I have left all of my engineering behind, uh, aside from still wearing the ring. Um, that's my story. Excellent. And I'm Stephen Grenade, and I volunteered to moderate this panel because I cosplay an engineer. <laughs> my PhD was in physics. And my dad is a college professor. My brother is a college professor. I looked at what academics was like for physics, and I said, stinky. No, thank you. And because I had been doing lasers and optics and cooling uh, atoms down to near absolute zero to look at quantum effects. And like, you know, lasers and optics can be an optical engineer. So that is what I have done ever since. So a word about this panel. We are very interested if people have questions, um, you can raise your hand. We have a mic there. You can come to the mic and stand. You can raise your hand. Some of my fellow, fellow volunteers will make the mic appear to you, uh, whichever you would prefer. So I'd like to start with what I'm going to call the uh, very, excuse me, this is a Wendy slash science track. What is the difference in your minds between science and engineering? 
<laughs> oh, Peter is very excited by this question. Uh, I, I actually, when you asked me to be on this panel, this is one of the things I thought about is, oh, good. first of all, the, the feels in my view, the, let, let me straighten this out first. Um, I run into people oftentimes, you know, not necessarily say man on the street sort of thing. And they say, what do you do? And I say, I'm a professor of electrical engineering. I'll usually I say I'm a professor. And then they say, what do you teach? And then I say, well, it's mostly research because then you got to get in all of that. And, um, and I'll say, you know, when I throw the electrical engineering in there, right? So right away they think I know about their house wiring. And, <laughs> you know, I tell you about the, you know, molecules and atoms and electrons at that level, but I can't fix anything, sadly. Um, so, but the, the difference, if you will, or lack of difference, particularly once you get to the research level, it is so intertwined. I mean, my, uh, it's funny because my collaborations mostly are with my peeps in physics. Um, and, and I've had many a friend go, you know, you're really a physicist coming to the light. You know, like, <laughs> Why do you keep it? I was like, I can you get paid a little bit more over here. I don't know. But, um, it's, it's very intertwined, particularly, at least my experiences at, at, when it comes to research. Um, I have to admit, I don't, my dad has been asking me for years, like, when are you going to make something? <laughs> um, I enjoy studying the phenomena that I see in the materials. So I guess that makes it, but. I have also had um, friends, you know, I say frenemies, in the sciences who um, I once had to explain to a chemist that my students were not monkeys in the lab that were just hammering stuff out, right? And you all have seen Big Bang Theory and the jokes about Howard and all that sort of thing, right? Um, it's, there are differences, yes, in terms of, and this is a, a lead to my panelists could say this better myself, who, who maybe look towards more the applied sort of work, um, but you can be quite frankly, involved in interesting, as I call it, fun phenomena, as well as applications. The applications that I'm, the work I'm in, the applications might be 50 years in the future, right? Not necessarily tomorrow or a product, right? But that's the beauty of it. It crosses a lot. It crosses between electrical and mechanical and chemical. Sometimes it's hard to tell the difference. Um, it just really depends on where you work, the environment you're in, and like Topher said, he's going through all you know kinds of pathways combined and back and forth. So it's to me super versatile, and I and I have to say this as a as a professor, which was honestly not my original career path thought. That's a whole other story, but uh, um, it gives you a lot of options. Like was also mentioned, I mean, like by way of the work I've done, I've done some stuff, you know, interning and whatnot in industry, but. In terms of conducting research, I have been on like every continent in the world except for Antarctica and Australia. You get people that you, because not, and not with the internet. I mean, yeah, I grew up before the internet. That did, was a time, y'all. <laughs> no internet. But now you reach really the world and you do get like, you know, before COVID, really to get, so I have like a dear friend now from Iceland who I met in India, you know, stuff like that. So if you want to travel, if as if after a four year degree, one of the most well paid degrees, if not the most, is one of the engineering disciplines, frankly. And um, last but not least, I'll just say quickly is I wanted to be when I was four. I thought I love science. Right. Anything, you know, well, some may remember National Geographic would come on da, 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 and I'd run in. And my mom was an elementary school teacher and she brought home these this set of books. And there was one about science. And I like I, I love the book. I wanted to be an artist and a scientist because I also love the arts. I'm on the art and science conversation tomorrow panel, right? And I overheard my dad say, maybe kind of, he was joking around because my friends in the arts get mad when they hear this, but he said, oh, artists only get famous after they're dead. And I was like five and I thought, oh, science all the way. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, really? And that was it. That was the end. And likewise, I have to give credit to my dad was a high school math teacher turned guidance counselor. My mom was elementary school teacher. They're fantastic. 42 years each in the New Orleans public school system. Wow. All those years, no air conditioning for my mom. 42 years in New Orleans. Y'all heard that? They are saints. Mm. But between, frankly, their encouragement of just learning. So even if you are, say, you're not so much the, the I, I was steam, as they say, before steam became cool. If you're not so much in the, you know, this type of engineering or this type, it really melts. And we'll, tomorrow there's a panel on science and, and art. So uh, let me stop. <laughs> yeah, so, like, I mean, that's that's very similar to what I had always ascertained from from just, uh, I guess, my education and, and, and whatever thoughts that, that my um, academic uh, 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 people who, who trained me um, would 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 put out there is that um, 
science was like, you know, science. I'm just saying what, <laughs> what I've heard, not necessarily the truth, but Watch science. It. <laughs> science was the like controlled experiments that you try to figure out like a, um, I don't know, like a, a truth. And, um, and like, how, is this a, is this a consistent repeatable thing that you can actually say happens? And then engineering was the like collection of all of those cool truths that, that, that we think are repeatable and, and consistent. And then like, how can we apply those? And, and, and that's where like a lot of industry that comes in. Right. So it's, it's, how can we actually do this? Like take this thing that we now know, which is just like a thing that we like know, how does it become useful? for us. Um, so for me, that, that's something that, you know, after working over a decade, it still resonates. It still seems like a, a good framework if it's not perfectly true. Yeah. Um, so I'll just have, I just have a kind of a quick note for me. Um, so my, since my background is in like applied, uh, kind of sciences, uh, for me, the difference between science and engineering is strictly like um, engineering has a schedule, a budget, and a manager. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> uh, and science doesn't necessarily have either. It doesn't have all the all of those things at once, or um, you know, they're longer term. So that's really the only difference on my side. I mean, I'm consistently looking at the phenomena. I'm consistently looking at how you know physics and aerodynamics and everything um, interacts with whatever kind of body I'm looking at, and. Um, I just have to figure out how to interpret those results. So in a, you know, in a um, probably shorter amount of time than I would like. But yeah, that's uh, that's kind of the summary in my experience. Yeah, I think I would I would probably mo most important to me is is distinguishing between the the label of what I do and what, how I was trained and everything else and me. I might call myself an engineer, but I do science. Yeah. I do engineering. Yeah. Yeah. There are lots of people, scientists who do both. And mm -hmm. Person, not function. Right. And then, like, the comment on, like, shorter time than you'd like. Like, that is another one thing that that, that just sparked the neuron in my head. Like, um, it, it was always, uh, engineering was, like, making decisions based on imperfect information or incomplete or imperfect information, right? You never have the whole story, but you're going to, like, kind of figure out what's the best angle. Um, that makes me feel a lot better, I'm going to be honest. <laughs> so much incomplete information. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, so I know that one of the, the like bugbears of going into engineering is the, the math that is involved. And I would be interested to hear from you about what role math plays and why, other than Ashley, it's mostly trig. <laughs> he was the veteran. Uh, okay. Anybody can jump in. Like, I mean, let's have I, a conversation. I, I loved math in high school. I hated math in college. Uh -huh. It was awful. I, I failed one of the classes. It was terrible. Um, what I did love is statistics. Um, Ew. What? Which, yes. Ew. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you need to wash your mouth out. <laughs> uh, it, 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 no, that's fair. It's okay. <laughs> no, um... So, you know, statistics, we could argue, is a applied math, but um, it's the one tool that most engineers I know use on a very regular basis. And if you get a good t like, the class I failed was the intro stats class, and it was because it was the classic dry instructor who was brilliant. I mean, no stats inside and out, but just a dry brick of yeah, personality. Yeah, teachers are so huge. You it's so huge and, anymore. You and then when I, so when I had to retake the course... The, the prof I took from, uh, he has been kicked out of almost every casino in Vegas because um, he's really good. And he was a consultant for uh, a couple of the um, uh, big uh, mathematics-centered uh, uh, shows that were, that were really popular for a while. Um, and he, was, he made it real. And it was so cool. It was like you know, the reality, the stats that is all around us. And that's when I hooked in, and I was like, oh, this is amazing. I wish I had him. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm with you, Tover. I, I actually really like math, uh, statistics. Like, statistics is, is such a cool thing that you can, like, conclude, you know, like, oh, yeah, like, it's subjective, right? A lot of these things are subjective, but you're, you can you can kind of model it, right? Which is, like, a thing in our society that we like to, we like to apply numbers to things. Uh, so it's just, like, kind of pleasant for how we're, we're programmed to work. Uh, but the other thing that, that I think is the most beautiful thing is calculus. Calculus is absolutely beautiful, like in an aesthetic and like a conceptual <laughs> awesome way because you have a formula that can be complicated as, as all get out and you can put every single solution to that formula on a line in a little box. That's so unbelievably powerful and beautiful. Like, 
Good. Numbers. I, I, I have to throw this in because I've been on panels before and I was so annoyed when it was, and this was a panel before a group of students, you know, making a bridge from high school to college. And one of the panelists said, um, oh, you better love math, 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 math. You got to know math. Gotta, and I could just see some of the kids' eyes like, you know, uh, whereas for me growing up, even though my dad was a math teacher, um, I enjoy the science and the math to me was basically a two you know it was like okay i gotta take the math and that's fine but you know it wasn't like too horrible or too great except for geometry never been my thing i cried i got a b in high school in one of the nine weeks and i just got to <laughs> my husband can tell you directions and i no nah. but any event so I, I would say particularly if you have uh kids or you're you know young you know the age yourself or coming back to school you don't have to be a math whiz. I mean, there's mathematics you need to take, and these days there's everything. I mean, there's I mean, there's like books, such and such for dummies. That whole series. Don't be ashamed. Get it. Maybe I maybe I hide it in my office because maybe I'm supposed to be the professor. <laughs> but it's there. You know, and I got it in there. And it's I, I would love to talk to you more to learn more. It's how I, that sounds because calculus. Honestly, to be honest, I just I memorize all the formulas. Mm. So I could get an A on the test and get on <laughs> because, and I, I knew for a fact that I didn't like know all that the form is applied to. But in my day to day right now, doing research in um, nanomaterials, nanoelectronics, nanoscience, nanotech, whatever you want to call it, I barely pull out my calculator. I mean, a lot of what I'm doing is um, with um, looking at, if you want to say, images and structures. And frankly, if I need it the statistics and that much mathematics and I'd get one of my colleagues who was an expert in that because I you know, can't really be an expert in everything, right? So I my think my message to you, particularly if you have kids, grandkids, yourself, what have you, is don't let the math overly scare you. And if you think you hate it, then maybe, you know, go on YouTube. There's everything or you might find somebody on YouTube who teaches it great. And one last thing is to be careful with because y'all still know, there's still the thing out there of like, girls can't do math. You may remember uh, the president of Harvard some years back, Larry Summers, made that comment about girls not being as adept. Yeah, this was in the 2000s, still, at math. Um, it also happens with, as they say now, underrepresented minorities. Our son is a computer scientist, but when he was in like third grade and eighth grade, we specifically went and talked to the teacher and said, He's an African-American male. We expect you to expect of him and what you do with every other student. It wouldn't be him, but there would be teachers out there who would assume, oh, here, here comes the black kid, and so he doesn't know as much. And that affects, you know, whether it's, you know, black, Asian, except, but if you have people who lower their expectations because of how you look. Mm -hmm. So you have to, as my fellow panelists have said, put yourself, some are going to find the beauty and elegance of it. Some are just going to find it as a tool. Some are going to find the right person or, or, or place to that excites them. And y'all have everything now. I mean, Google, my God, you don't have to walk to the library. I actually make my, I tell my students, I, I want you at least once a semester to walk to the library. Just physically pick up a book. I don't care. You have to still do that. Old fashioned. But anyway, so don't let the math throw you away. It can be done, and there's very many, many ways now to find a way to do it. But it's okay if you like math. Oh, yeah. It's okay because yeah, okay. I was going to say, Ashley, yours is pretty math heavy, right? I love math. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> See, like your job is is you you must do a million yeah, amounts it, of math every single day. I was going to say, talk a little bit about yours because yours is such an interesting uh, section of engineering. I'd love to hear more. Sure. Yeah. So um, so I do math. I do math every day. I do. Um, math on the uh, back of napkins at restaurants. I do math, um, <laughs> you know, in my head when I'm walking to my car. Like I just do math all the time, and it's um, it's it, for me, it's it's it is a tool, definitely for sure. But it's like um, it's also like a you know, it's just like something that I have with me all the time that is the structure for what I'm actually trying to create. So. Uh, so like I'm doing, um, like I said, I, I, you know, I used to design, um, design airplanes. So I was, you know, designing wings and, um, designing like external contours of the aircraft. And, um, so, and I was doing a lot of CFD computational fluid dynamics, which is like a wind tunnel in a computer. Um, and so I'm using with, with that, you know, I'm using, um, like the, uh, uh, the, um, overarching kind of. Uh, equations for aerodynamics, which are called the Navier-Stokes equations. They're like a, um, 
un, uh, they're not uh, solved, so you can't like you can't solve directly for them. So you have to use like equations to other equations that you kind of substitute in to um, solve them. Anyway, they're um, they're very complex, and uh, that's like kind of our my bread and butter. Um, but yeah, so for me, I mean, every day it comes into play, and so I'll I'll. You know, I'll, I'll use math a lot to check my work, too, because computational fluid dynamics is very, um, uh, like, it's, 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 it's a code written by humans, right, who make mistakes and um, who also, um, you know, uh, there are certain uh, uh, assumptions that are made with that code. So you have to know what assumptions you're, um, you're using when you run certain codes and when you uh, create certain things. Uh, so, uh, so for me, you know, I check a lot of that work. I'll do sort of back of the envelope comp calculations, like just to see if, you know, it looks like um, this temperature is maybe in the right ballpark or like if it looks like this boundary layer thickness on this wing is, um, you know, in the right ballpark or whatever. So I'll do that on a regular basis. So math is super important to me and, you know, I, I really love using it and it, you know, it gets really complex for my job, but like everybody else has said on the panel, you know, that's, that's, um, that's just one aspect, right? You can do engineering and, you know, have have a lot less uh, uh, math-heavy positions, I guess. I love hearing that because from the physics side, they taught us how to derive the Navier-Stokes equations. They're like, well, it can't be solved. You can simulate it. So let's move on. <laughs> and that was the beginning and end of my Navier-Stokes experience. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so uh, that's the start of my Navier-Stokes experience. <laughs> it seems like you're actually doing things with it and you were just playing with math, which I did like. I, like you, Matt, uh, calculus is really where math started to sing for me mm -hmm. and I really enjoyed it and uh, I managed to get out of undergraduate without a linear algebra uh, <laughs> class. I was like, eh, that probably won't be important except like all of physics quantum <laughs> mechanics depends on it. But then I was like, I'm going to go be an engineer. It's really cool. You know where matrix shows up? It's in coordinate transforms. And as a sensor person, that is my life. My life is coordinate transforms and cables that on tests, animals chew in the night and make break. I did not factor on that when I went into there. All right, Theta, you may need to cover your ears on this next question. I'd be interested to hear how your academic experience differs from your industry experience of engineering. No, I think so. I, I, That's I, what I, I'm yeah, saying, yeah. yes. Something you told me. Just well, anybody. any of the three of you, fight it Yeah, out. I mean, I guess, like, real quick, like, why did I take diffy cues? Like, <laughs> like why did why did oh I have gosh. to take diffy cues? Uh, <laughs> like I don't I, I I don't come anywhere close to that. I've worked as an engineer for for over a decade. Uh, I I have never seen a reason to have learned. And diffy what are diffy cues? Uh, so it is basically like calculus and calculus. Differential right? equations. Yeah. So differential equations. Yeah. Sorry. So it's like uh, you have one equation that describes how one thing changes relative to another, and another equation that describes how one thing changes relative to another, and then you decide that you want to know how those two changes relative to each other change relative to each <laughs> other. If I remember from 15 years ago. <laughs> I, I got I'm, I'm to. Coming the over here. No, please go ahead. I have this. I'm pointing to my dear husband, um, who is, I think, a brilliant man. He is both a physician and an attorney. He got his MD and his JD. Um, and I, I said to the previous panel, he, not because he got sued. There was nothing like that. <laughs> <laughs> he delivered babies for many years, and then likewise, also in additional interest, he went back, got his law degree. But he told we met as undergraduates at Rice, and he told me that he was considering engineering or would have, but he heard about Diffie cues and it sounded too close to Diffie cult. Now this is from somebody who went pre-med and, but, but it just tells you how labels, labels, you know, whether it's a label of the, of the, of the subject or, the, or labeling and, and honest and stereotyping people, all these things come into play. I'm sorry, did you have something said? <laughs> Y'all should have seen I'm, I'm the just, look. Yeah, I'm, just, I'm just an artist. <laughs> no, oh, no, that was the other thing. At Rice, was, <laughs> they only gave the Bachelor of Science if you were in one of the sciences or engineering. When I'm sorry, no, sorry, if you were in engineering, engineering. Yeah, physics, didn't get yeah, physics you got a BA. Biology, you got a BA. Wow, chemistry is a BA. And so that's why he says he's an artist. But you were an artist of the, you know, obstetrics, gynecology. Many people are very <laughs> grateful for your artistic knowledge. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
<laughs> I've never heard of Baby York uh, before. Topher, Ashley, if you'd like to drive us back out of the ditch. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Sure. Um, yeah, so for me, uh, I mean, a lot of my, um, you know, a lot of my time spent uh, as an undergrad, especially, was not really about learning the subject matter. Is It was more about learning how to learn. Uh, it was more about mm -hmm. learning... Um, how to actually absorb information from books and from people and from um, uh, and from people who know a lot more than you. I, uh, I'm, I mean, I kind of think highly of myself, so I kind of, you know, think I know a lot sometimes. And um, uh, especially as an undergrad, you know, I thought I knew a lot, and uh, you know, I, it's it, it takes some time to for me to um, you know kind of trust somebody into what they're what they're teaching you and you know that's what undergrad was for me it was a lot about um it was a lot about learning how to learn and um you know it's funny because um I was so excited I got my first um I aced my first test I got 100% on a test and it was in chemistry y'all so I don't use chemistry ever like <laughs> <laughs> so yeah <laughs> that's my experience yeah I, I underscore that I mean it was it it's not that the coursework that I carry forward, it's its the approach, it's the thinking process, it's the way of, of dealing with the problem. I mean, one of my favorite examples is I was at a conference with another engineer. It was a microbiology biofilm conference, uh, so the two engineers are here frantically trying to understand all this stuff that the people are saying. And then we both get an email from our boss saying, hey, uh, we need I need you two to learn everything you can about platelet-rich plasma uh, and present it to us in two weeks. We're both looking at each other like, I didn't even know what those words mean. <laughs> <laughs> so in two weeks, the two of us crammed and became experts in PRP therapy and then presented it to the company and convinced them whether or not they should you know, make this multi-million dollar acquisition. Because you just learned to run on your feet really yeah. fast. Yeah, it's, it's a really good... Um synopsis that like you're just being taught how to learn or like like being taught how to problem solve being taught how to interact with things how do you process all the information and, that you're that is available to you and, and synthesizing knowledge so yes, taking these discrete yes. facts and turning it into a new concept right and i found that professional schools really like um engineering students right say if you get um a degree in one of the engineering disciplines that's another thing right it's not the engineering department it, you know, it may be the College of Engineering or the School of Engineering at your university, but there are different disciplines or different departments of engineering, right? So, um, but professional schools really like, the, because, you know, as a student and even now as a professor, you know, this kid, you learn how to grind. As I mean, you, you all-nighters are just, you know, yeah. part of your life. Yeah. I still do all-nighters. My body goes, you're not in college, you <laughs> idiot. But, but I still have, you know, times, my normal bedtime is maybe 2 a.m. plus or minus. And then I've done where the next morning our son is going, Mom, you're still here? Because he went to bed at 8 and it's 8 the next morning and I'm still at the desk. So, But you learn how to work. So, like, if you want to go to law school or med school or, you know, divinity school, like they have one at Duke or, you know, what have it, get your MBA, they like those students because they find that I've, I've heard many an engineering student say how, you know, oh, you know, I went to name the professional school and man, you know, I got a lot of time because they were used to like always, you know, uh, so you learn how to learn that. Uh, that's, that's, it's, it's a great, if you want to say discipline in addition to the science, in addition to the application, wherever you fall in that spectrum. So it sounds like y'all are sort of coming to a, a point of describing it as knowledge acquisition and application. Is that a fair kind of summary of that cool at least the education yeah cool um so when we were discussing this ahead of time ashley you said something that i had to write down because i wanted to talk more about it uh engineering can be less like making a puzzle and more like fitting the puzzle pieces together in unique ways yes. would you talk a little bit about that and then i'd like to hear other folks's uh sure. response to that sure yeah so um a lot of times with, with engineering, and this kind of goes back to the whole application, having a schedule, having a budget type of discussion, where you're given a lot of the pieces um, because a company has, they have to meet some sort of, um, 
you know, bottom line, they have to, they have to meet some sort of a goal or whatever for that quarter, for that year, whatever it is. And, um, they already have a lot, usually, uh, um, in a lot of cases, they already have a lot of these kind of pieces in place. They already have your requirements built for you. So a lot of times as engineers, we get pieces to this puzzle. We get the requirements, we get a budget, we get, um, we get tools that we get to use and we have to figure out how to most um, efficiently use all these tools and create something amazing. Uh, so that's kind of why I, you know, um, I think of it more as like putting the puzzle pieces together. Um, uh, I think operations may have a little bit of different, uh, <laughs> different uh, kind of uh, viewpoint on that because operations is actually kind of creating those puzzle pieces. So, um, but yeah, from my standpoint, it's kind of, it's kind of more like yeah, I think the thing that first comes to mind is um, creating something amazing. Uh, I feel that 80% of the time I am very much limited, <laughs> uh, prevented from doing that because of budgets and because of schedules. And sometimes, well, I mean, most of the time you are creating something that sufficiently meets Sufficient. the requirements which have been previously agreed upon by hopefully some prudent people. <laughs> so, standard. Yeah. Meeting a standard, which is not always excellent. Right. That's that's true. That's true. <laughs> uh, sorry, did we have a... Uh, hang on just a second. Can we get the mic? Uh, I, I think I can make myself heard. Sorry. Um, can you comment on the applicability here of good is the enemy... Or, sorry, better is the enemy of good enough? Mm. So, comment on the uh, better is the enemy of good enough. Uh, this, is, this is like... <laughs> I want to use the term like religious debate here <laughs> because like as a, a very technically focused person, like I want to do the excellent and I'm always like shooting for the excellent. That's the star that's always up there that I want to point to. Um, but I, I, you know, I work with a lot of program managers and project engineers who have accountability to the budget and, um, and that's just, a, it's just a limitation to it. Um, yeah, that's, that's strikes me. For me, it's the difference of like, it's like where the research stops and where my engineering begins. Because like, I usually have a part of like, when I do a project, there's usually a, for me, I set aside a certain amount of time to like run the CFD or run tests or whatever, and get all the information that I need to make my decisions. And so like, I usually have to cut that short, right? So I have to decide when, when is enough information enough? and then um, make decisions based on that information. And I guess from a, a medical products perspective, you know, we're, we're dealing with not only FDA regulation and clinician adoption of a product and then marketing not maybe may or may not comprehend what it is they actually want to be able to sell to the, to the customer. And I mean, my favorite memory is a, is a marketing person coming to us. We were de designing a new uh, <laughs> diagnostic instrument and uh, they said, well, and, and it, should, it should upload all the data to the cloud. Like, okay, what, 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 what cloud? Where's the server that the hospital is using? I don't know. It's just the cloud. Like, uh. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, and it's interesting you mentioned medical, too, because, like, for me, it, there's such a big difference in the experience that I had in medical versus defense. Like, defense was very budget focused and like not that medical wasn't but like you were very regulatory approval and technical accuracy and high process control uh, very very strict process control um, and and it really it, there was never a lot of pushback for hey this is this doesn't meet the requirements and we need to scrap a whole bunch there wasn't a lot of pushback against like Scrapping it, and, you know, there's not a lot of like, oh, well, could we make it work? Whereas there, there actually is a lot of that in defense. I think we have a question from the audience. Hi. First of all, I, I recorded a couple of your answers, so I just want to make sure that was okay. Otherwise, I'll delete the recordings. And um, secondly, I do academic advising for freshmen and sophomores at a community college. Bless you. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. And thank Love you so it much. So much. <laughs> Um, and so, first of all, the DFEQ comment was hilarious. Thank you so much. <laughs> and um, what, I'm not an engineer. I'm, I'm elementary education all the way. But I work with, with freshmen and sophomore who are wanting to go into engineering. So what is some advice 
that you would give to a freshman or a sophomore knowing what you know now? I feel a lot better with your comments about math. Um, and, but, but what are some other things that I can do now for these kids before they get to you in your classes so you, they're going to be better prepared? Oh, sure. Thank you so much. And first of all, I honestly, from my heart, I applaud you and um, the community, college community, um, which is sometimes, oftentimes, you know, marginalized even mentally, you know, you know, right, uh, to your degree, yeah, right? But um, right now, and, and let's just put it this way, in the pandemic, you know, people started really looking at their pocketbooks that much more. So, for example, just I'll take it out of STEM for just a second. You could get an MBA at one university online in Louisiana, and you could get an MBA at another university online in Louisiana. It was still an MBA. Where were people going? Where it was less expensive? Mm -hmm. But by the same token, in the community college community, what we found is get excellent students because you're, foc you're very focused on preparing someone to do a certain thing. And so, for example, at LSU, um, I'm not sure if it's still going on, but there was a program between BRCC, Baton Rouge Community College, and LSU, and people would do the first couple of years at BRCC, and then they'd come to LSU. And we had a lot of, as is now known, non-traditional students. So traditional is like right out of high school, but people who are like veterans, um, single parents. Um, I have a case in point, um, is uh, to answer your question, I hope, is a woman who I had in my classes, she just looked like a kid. She looked very young, but she was about 40-something years old. And she told me that she had worked, uh, she was a single mom, and she had worked as a waitress for 20 years to save up enough money for college. And she started at the community college, and they said, you're really great in math and physics. You need to go and get, you know, a, a degree in, let's say, well, in her case, she picked electrical engineering. Now, she was going along just fine, but she found she was running out of money. And she happened to be talking to me, and she said, well, I think I'm going to have to stop. And I went, no, you're not. No, 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 no. I said, we're going to find somebody with some money around here somewhere. And so I um, introduced her to, like, you know, this person handles scholarships, and this person, I think they do internships. And just and her, if you would have looked at her resume, you would have said, like, she had stuff she'd done with Fortune 500 companies. She had, you know, all this thing, but she just didn't have that final four-year degree. But all she, So one thing I would tell you for your students, and you're talking about um, freshmen and sophomores, so freshmen and sophomores at the given community college where you right. work. Okay. You're right. They're veterans who are, you know, coming back from their, their VA education, or they're 18-year-olds who are right out of high school but don't have cars. Yes. Or, or they are the stay-at-home person who's now, their kids are in high school, so it's their turn. So it's, it's like full-on all demographics. Um, and, and, and some of them have been away from school for a little while. So mm -hmm. we do a lot of like academically how to study uh, kind of advice sure. as well as what classes do you need to take. So. And, and to be fair, and honestly, I've had students, you know, who came from say a community college and had to do a bit of a catch up because, you know, it's like at, at certain, uh, say the chemistry class that I remember coming out of high school, my chemistry teacher said all girls Catholic school, right? New Orleans. Girls, they're going to cover what we've covered all year, you know, like in less than a semester. And when I got to Rice, they covered what I had in chemistry in two weeks. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay. So one thing I would say for your students is any opportunity for exposure, whether it's literally telling them, you know, getting in contact with some folks, say, at the four-year institution nearby and saying, hey, would you mind a student shadowing you? Do you have something for the summer? They don't, even if someone, you know, if a student's in a position where they don't necessarily at that point need the money, but one more thing that on, um, if you go to um, Google and you type in research experiences for undergraduates, mm -hmm. the National Science Foundation yep. has just the plethora of, at any university you could probably think of, has these summer programs that get this, they'll pay for you to go there, so if it's like a plane flight, they'll pay for you to come back home, like say at the end of two weeks. You'll do some sort of, you know, research experience with, you know, at a, at a university with someone. Um, sometimes they have certain GPA requir requirements and sometimes they don't. You just kind of have to dig around. And um, I've seen them anywhere like the, le the maybe lowest maybe was for $3,000 for 10 weeks worth of work. And I've seen them go up to, say, nine or $10,000. Yeah. Um, likewise, summer internships with companies. I've had undergraduates who, because they had a little bit of exposure, maybe they did something in my lab, some independent study, looked great on the resume. 
Um, I had a kid who he was going to go away for 10 weeks for the summer and he was going to make 15K, $15,000, just, you know, which is great when you're trying to get through college, you know. So that's one of the things, actually, these are all in engineering, by the way. Um, and, and I think they probably do have them in the basic sciences, but I will say, to be honest, when I looked at my transition from basic science thought process to engineering, which is like elementary to high school, that's another story. But the point is, 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 is I saw in engineering, there are very defined internships and programs out there. So I would say, please have your, have your students and yourself. You don't have to be the STEM person, right? Just see who is your equivalent at other institutions, who else is doing the um, ed, of STEM education. And, um, and there's oftentimes faculty who just need another pair of hands. And all of that goes on the resume. Yeah. So kind of get out of this, okay, I mean, you got to do your homework, get your good grades. Yeah. But start talking to people like these folks on these panels or at Dragon Con. I mean, I mean, you just got a yeah. plethora of people you can talk <laughs> to. So, so get them expand, expand their. I don't. Mind. I don't want to talk for like eight hours about this, but like so many things were just said that are that are just so relevant and special to me. That um, uh, so I, I had I had I've got a lot of medical stuff. I was very sick when I was a kid, and I had to drop out of high school. But I went back to to community college. I got my GED. I went to community college. I still didn't know what engineering was at that time. Um, in Massachusetts, we have the Commonwealth Compact. So if you get an associate's degree at a community college, you get guaranteed entry to state schools. So they look and see if your states have um, have uh, uh, programs like that. Um, those people who are at community colleges, in my opinion, generally speaking, are people who want to be there. They aren't people who their parents told them, you have to go to college. Because mm -hmm. if, if that was the case, then they'd probably be going straight for a state, a state school or something like that, or a private school. Um, you're, you're usually putting an effort to get there. Like, you want to be there. And so uh, I, I applaud everybody in that environment. And I especially applaud you for helping facilitate between that, that experience and and, um, and and getting to, to where they want to go next. Internships, absolutely huge. The internships that I had when I was in college were the defining reason why I got a job out of college, because I already had a year and a half of experience. Absolutely huge. I did a research experience for undergraduates, which I was a mechanical engineering um, uh, major, but I, I got one in uh, uh, tomography um, uh, in, in um, uh, meteorite research. So it was it was applying tomography, which is like a cross sectioning. It's kind of like an MRI for your you know for for a rock, um, <laughs> and uh, and trying to figure out how you can like do computer models to figure out where the, the little chondrules are, which are little mineral deposits inside. But I digress. So but that that was like something that well, why would a mechanical engineering person ever get that you know? But yet these opportunities can be made available. So it's. Um, it's it's really it's 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 very good stuff. Um, in fact, I the, story, I the internships that I did, and this was before research or reuse existed, were with oil companies because that's what's around, you know, New Orleans. And I don't, I I mean, downhole drilling cement slurry was not part of the EE curriculum yeah. at all. <laughs> but slurry. it did look, you know, yeah, the slurry of the cement and all that. But I did sort of like an economic study, even right. But it still looks good on a on a person's Absolutely. resume to say you worked for you know such and such company. It shows that you can think beyond just that yeah. box pattern. So anything you can do to expose your students of whatever age, and particularly the students who are more experienced, the like so the veterans and so forth, they've got that much more to bring to the table. Sometimes, to be frank, that's a little bit harder because a lot of people, a lot of professors are looking for that 18 to 22 year old, but. If you, you know, there are universities that do have programs that will um, give opportunities to the quote unquote non traditional student. So you just have to dig a little bit. I mean, Google everything, honestly, but it's out there. Yeah. Ashley Topher, anything you'd like to add? I'd just say, I mean, it's, you never know where the job's going to take you. But in this career, if I go, could go back to the 18 year old me and tell him where he was headed, like, you're nuts. <laughs> Same here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I think just just really quickly for me, um, uh, you really get good at the things that you practice. So, um, and this, I don't mean like uh, um, like math or like like writing down equations or whatever. I'm talking about like asking questions in class and talking to your professors outside of class and um, sit in the front. Sit in the front, mm -hmm. sit particularly in the front. girls. They're going to know you're there anyway. There's not many of us, right? So you may as well sit in the front. Mm -hmm. People yeah. knew my name before I took their class. I'm like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. The, when you're the only one out of, mm -hmm. out of fifty, it's yeah, that's it. Um, uh, 
Yeah, so I think um, practice the things that are going to um, help you get to where you want to be. So, uh, you know, seek out the people that that um, that know more than you and um, learn from them and um, ask ask questions and never never stop asking questions. That's like the biggest thing. <laughs> yeah, it's tied into both of those. It's like, you know, I work as a manufacturing engineer. I did that for eight or nine years before I moved into quality. And I worked with other manufacturing engineers who were chemical engineers, industrial engineers, software engineers, um, and those are just a couple of my friends that I, that I, that I know of, but you know, mechanical engineers, uh, there's, you can get any one of the n numerous degrees and still get like an engineering job that had perceivably nothing to do with what you studied. Yeah. I think that definitely goes back to the learning how to learn yes. that you were talking about. Yeah. And I will co-sign all of this. Uh, my tiny, uh, liberal arts undergraduate, you know, had a handful of science people and I got an REU at University of Central Florida to do optics. And that was like the first oh, domino wow. to start all of that. Um, I have seen in the companies that I've worked for will bring in interns and they will learn the ropes and they have a more of a direct in. So finding companies to partner with is great. The other thing I will say, and I do not want to oversell this because I don't think it is like the be all end all that some people say, but I have found that engineers who also have some programming experience and background oh, yeah. are yeah. able to slot into oh, a lot yeah. more spaces because software is in so many things. And, uh, you know, if they don't like it, they don't have to do it. If they do like it, though, that is another end that I, I certainly have looked for when bringing in engineers because I know you can help here and you can help here. And, you, you know, you'll be doing mechanical engineering and also some of the software that will go into this hardware that we're building. And programming languages you can do on your own. Like you don't have to have like somebody to teach you because Google exists and literally just and like there are so many good books on like Python or C++ or whatever programming language you want to start on. Like grab a book, grab it, sit down at a computer and just write and you can you can do all that straight, you know, without anybody. So YouTube. Uh, we didn't know that our oldest knew as much as I mean, you know, he yeah, growing as a kid and He's, uh, what, 27 now, 70? <laughs> He's 20. But um, he got a lot of things when we figured he was just, you know, we monitored it. But, you know, he was on the computer, and we didn't know he was getting training himself with YouTube um, in addition to things he read. And so by the time he was in high school, they were asking him to um, check the security of the schools. You know, they, they, in fact, he and another kid, in fact, well, let's put it this way. This another At his high school, which is a very good high school, and he didn't tell us till he graduated because he knew I wasn't going to yell, but I certainly was going to at least talk to them about the thousands of dollars we were paying and why did the coach, why was he teaching computer science and told the boys, hey, guys, I don't really know what this is. Just do what you want with the book. Woo. But to but by having dealt with or having trained himself in a lot of things, right, it also gave him the experience where they said, okay, check our security. And he and another kid hacked the system in 10 minutes and went, you have no security. We can see everybody's grades, right? And so there's a lot of things that you're, you're, you yourself or your kids and so forth can learn. Just, I'm not trying to like, I'm not a YouTube anybody, you know, but, and, and the books, you know, as Ashley said, just, it's all, it's really there. And sometimes it does call into question, well, why am I paying money to go here? Why am I spending that to do there? Frankly, access, the world still works. Into, I, there's a lot of things that I have gotten because of some of the name schools that I've been to that I wouldn't have gotten other places. But don't be discouraged as in, well, I'm not going to, you know, Georgia Tech. You know, I'm going here. It's still, it's still humanity. There's still flesh and blood. We're not hugging each other now, right? It's the COVID, but... They're still looking in the eye. I've told so many people, including our own kids, email's fine, right? All that's fine. Go to the person's office. It's a lot harder to say no with that human being standing right in front of you than it is over the phone or on any electronic. So, I you, you, you do what? Well, that's you hear that. I emailed them. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. he, he, he looked at email for like 60 places for he and his now wife, then fiance's wedding, and like, and did a slow chart and couldn't find anything. And his mother in law went, I made one phone call. I called, here's a place, good price. You know, so you have to remember, use the old technology too. Yeah. It works. Yeah. You know, slightly connected to that too. Like, you never, 
you're 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 very unlikely to get anything that you don't ask for. Oh God, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. Like just go find people and talk to them about what you have you're not interested because in. Because you ask not, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. That's yeah. <laughs> Yes. I forgot the question. So I think we've got another question. <laughs> <laughs> this will probably be our last one. Pardon the philosophical nature of the question. It's my first degree coming out. Engineering and science are often advanced as a result of lessons learned from failure. In anyone's opinion, what do you think is probably one of the more consequential failures that led to a significant advancement? COVID. <laughs> right, we have an mRNA panel that we're coming up with, uh, that you know, or the, a technology of mRNA, mRNA vaccine technology that like we've been talking about for a while, but it was never. I don't think it was ever approved, right? Yeah, and we never had one actually approved, but now we've got some concrete experience that uh, that that we're like, okay, yeah, this is this is a thing that we're you know we're gonna allow. That's a pretty cool one. It's gonna open up a whole new era of of applications for, for that sort of technology, which is engineering. Yeah, I mean, I, I think there have been thousands of, of examples throughout history. I mean, there's the, you know, the uh, the, the uh, famous example of the T Tacoma Narrows Bridge, um, you know, the Challenger disaster, um, uh, the ASR hip recall from Depew, you know, there's just endless examples of, of situations. Um, it's why, and that's why I'm fiddling with my ring because, in Canada, there's a tradition, all engineers um, take the iron ring, and uh, the, the idea is it's supposed to be a physical reminder of your responsibility to society. It's worn on the writing hand, and every time you put pencil to paper in the old-fashioned days, you would hear that as a reminder of that everything I do, every choice I make, can potentially cost many, many dollars and harm many, many people. Um, so, yeah, there. I don't know if I could point to a single failure that's categorically V1. And if I, I'm grateful, frankly, for the philosophical end, um, and please, no apology needed, because even though we've talked about engineering and science intertwining, the arts and philosophy and so forth are very much intertwined. In fact, one of the areas people are looking at in a big way is cybersecurity and behavioral science. Not to say profiling, you know, I, I can't think of a better word, but how do you look at certain behaviors to determine that this person and this action could be a dangerous hacker. And you can't just do that with some folks writing code. You need some people who can deal with how people think and historically philosophies that have in interacted with you know efforts and things that have occurred, failures and results. Because there's still, I think there still aren't necessarily enough people asking the question why. And I don't mean why in terms of research, but even why are we doing this? And is it, you know, it's like, hey, this is a great thing to do, this is a great thing to do, but what's going to happen? And for that, we need the philosophers and the historians and the artists to kind of keep us all balanced and grounded. Um, STEM is great, but I think STEAM in that way, I probably should say, I don't keep my job. STEAM may be even better, you know, because mm -hmm. it, more minds, more diversity, that's the whole deal, right? And you don't have to be a professor if you get a PhD. I want you to throw that in real quick. <laughs> <laughs> that was not my original plan, but it, it worked out because I like to be independent. It seemed like it's a whole lot better deal than you know somebody telling me what to do, so that's why I went to academia. But you can get a doctorate, and you can thrive in industry, have your own company, all kinds of ways to go. Education, teach you know, um, in, in the public eye, as Dr. Grenade does. So you don't have to sit behind. And, and I didn't want to grade papers, but the... <laughs> But the other stuff was cool. I could have my own lab, blah, blah, blah. Okay. But they don't give it to you. That's another thing. Be prepared. Uh, if you have students, or, or I say students, kids and so forth, the part, you have to know how to write as well. I mean, there's a stereotype of I've been told, oh, you're very articulate for an engineer. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I went to school. I know Dang. how to make a pass, you know. <laughs> but you have to um, also not ignore that communication ability, and as much as I'm talking up here, this is not my norm, I promise you. This is many years in practice and imitating my mom, because I, you could send me to a party, put me in a book in the corner, and I'm perfectly happy, okay? But you, you have to, as someone said, you, you ask, you have not, because you ask not, I think is the expression, um, or the term that someone told me, um, and you have to remember that, as I heard in the previous panel, 
be true to yourself. And sometimes you don't even know what you don't know, so be open. Yeah, yeah. That might be like the biggest takeaway. Like just be open to the, all the different like mixtures and com uh, combinations of education and application and thought and knowledge and doing. And it's just, yeah. That seems like a wonderful way to end this discussion. <laughs> Please join me in thanking all of our wonderful panelists. A reminder, you're welcome to make Dragon Con pay more money to Big Brother Big Sisters. And if you would like a science track ribbon, we have ribbons over there in original and extra goose flavor.